We have now released issue three of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the impact of recent revelations by the military, the government, and the scientific community regarding the existence of mysterious phenomena sometimes identified as UFOs or unidentified aerial phenomena, sometimes associated with alien intelligences, non-human intelligences, and etc., or let's just say events of high strangeness. My guest is Sean McNamara. He is the author of Coping with UFOs slash UAP in the news and in real life. Sean is the author of about a dozen other books on training paranormal abilities, including remote viewing, telekinesis, out-of-body experiences, lucid dreaming, he is also the author of, of a recent book, and we've done a recent interview about his experiences with psychedelic drugs and their relationship to psychic abilities. Welcome, Sean. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you for coming to Albuquerque. You're welcome. We have all been exposed to the news stories at this point and uh, regarding, amongst other things, government hearings and the revelations regarding government research programs looking into these mysterious phenomena for which we have no explanation. So, I, th I think it's pretty clear now to anybody who's paying attention, regardless of how you interpret these events, they, they pose a, a mystery, an ever-present mystery. And now's an interesting time because paying attention to the issue used to be more of a choice. And now it's getting harder to ignore it because of the nature of the internet and how news media functions. So whether or not someone is interested in the UAP or UFO topic, uh, they don't have that much choice anymore because it's going to be, it's been in the news. We've heard about congressional hearings. We've heard about NASA doing some research. And it's, it's out there whether or not you, a person would like that to be part of their life. It's part of all of our lives now more than ever. And I think because of the internet. On the other hand, there have always been the so-called scoffers. I prefer the term scoffers to debunkers. Be, because as, as my friend Stanley Krippner points out, the very term debunker assumes that there's something, some bunk to be debunked. Uh, but the scoffers insist that this can't be real. And, and for decades, the attitude has been that people who report these things, that there's something wrong with them. That's a defensive, a defensive gesture on their part, that there's something wrong with that, everybody else. There's nothing wrong with me. And I think we can have empathy for people with that attitude because this idea of craft from another civilization or other types of beings, non-human intelligence, is very threatening to many people's worldview. So the people who are scoffing, the scoffers, they might be experiencing a, a worldview crisis. Some people are using the term ontological crisis. I don't like it because that's a little too complicated. Worldview really expresses what it means. They're having a worldview crisis, and this is how they're responding to it, that this couldn't be true, and everybody else must be wrong, because they have a viewpoint about what their reality is, and this is violating it in a severe way. Well, also, to my understanding, the government had an official policy, maybe going back to the uh, 
Robertson Commission in 1954 that it would be in the uh, interest of public safety to not scare the public that the government doesn't have a clue as to what's going on. So uh, the, the government was involved in deep I'm scoffing or I use the word very loosely when I say debunking the these reports, although we know many times the reports could be attributed to natural phenomena. Mm -hmm. And I think the government is just fulfilling their role as government and in a government that's been around for at least a few hundred years or taken on the knowledge from previous governments throughout history understands what it is to manage a population that there needs to be a sense of control, that the population has to have faith in the ability of the government to protect the population, to give the population information, to keep them healthy and fed, to provide a sense of security. Any government that wants to stay in place, that wants to be stable and strong, needs to convey that sense of security to the population. And I can't think of anything else that's so strongly counteracts the government's ability to maintain control. The UFO phenomena is completely out of reach of any governing body, of any military body, of any scientific body. It's still so far out there that, that we can't do anything about it except observe and react in various ways. And so for the government, I think they're threatened by the theme still. They're trying to get their hands on it now by being more open about it, by doing some research. But still, I can see the government's viewpoint that, well, if people start to realize that we have no idea what's going on, that could cause us some problems. Well, there is a paradox. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the, the paradox could be expressed this way, that uh, government seems to be acknowledging that there are craft and that these craft have capabilities of maneuvering far exceeding anything produced uh, by any government in terms of speed, in terms of the ability to make right angle turns or reduce uh, their direction, reverse their direction instantaneously uh, that uh, is beyond human capability as far as we know. And then on the other hand, you have a, a whole group of astronomers who say, we've been searching for their radio signals, for their electromagnetic signals. Now for nearly half a century, we don't have any indication that they're using electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic communication of, of any kind. And surely if we were being visited by intelligent creatures from outer space, naturally, they would want to use electromagnetic communication. It's one of the four basic forces that we understand in physics. Right. And it could all be a question of a wrong approach. They might be trained to look for a horse and carriage, and they're ignoring the race cars that are coming by. So thinking about radio signals as the only way or the primary way that these beings might be communicating with us. You it, it might be the wrong place to look and not to discount all the work and millions or billions of dollars put into telescope arrays over the last few decades to search for that signal. That's important, but they might just be looking in the wrong place. Might be. On the other hand, you, you think that they'd have some electromagnetic signature somewhere, which to me suggests that maybe they are not coming from elsewhere in the universe. Maybe they are uh, some other kind of phenomena entirely. Many people would say, oh, it's all in the mind. And if, if you're a philosophical idealist such as myself, I would say the mind, of course, it's a vast universe. Everything is all in the mind. And if, it's, if it is something of a, a mental phenomenon, then we wouldn't necessarily expect it to have electromagnetic properties. And it might be more akin to, as many writers have suggested, the ancient gods who have come down to earth in their chariots. And, and uh, we see reports of those kind of communications in many, many cultures around the world going back over uh, thousands of years. Well, I, I definitely agree with you on a lot of those points that this could be a phenomenon 
of the mind itself. There, one reason I say that is because in my research in psychic abilities, I see parallels between how the mind functions psychically and how UFOs, um, how they move through space and time. They seem to know where, let's say, uh, in a recent example, there are some fighter jets and they're being ordered to go to a cap point and the UFOs that they hope to see arrive there before somehow the UFOs knew where the jets were flying. Yeah. So they're showing precognition. Mm -hmm. And the ability to suddenly disappear, that's a classical psychic ability um, in various ancient tests, texts about development you can do on yourself through meditation to perform miracles, disappearing instantly, uh, knowing the minds of others, precognition, retrocognition, the ability to disappear, to move through matter. These are all classical psychic powers for people who meditate for, for their whole lives. They can develop these abilities. So that UFOs are doing the same thing that yogis meditating in caves or in jungles. They have the same ability. It tells me that maybe the people who are driving the UFOs, or the UFOs themselves, know something about the unity of consciousness and the fabric of space-time. Maybe they know the same thing that these yogis do, and they've just amplified it with the use of technology or by some other means. This might not be about electromagnetism in many cases. It could be about space of reality itself. If we consider that consciousness might be the fundamental basis of reality, instead of the physical world. Well, that's basically where I'm coming from. And it begs the question, though, we have a population of 8 billion people on this planet, and certainly in the uh, Western European uh, countries, the democracies, and many of the other autocracies on this planet, the uh, culture is a materialistic culture. Mm. And people are being confronted with these phenomena that totally defy expectations for uh, material phenomena. Right. These phenomena are exhibiting what is typically talked about in traditional religion. And many people can take or leave religion and say, I don't believe in that or that didn't really happen. But now the UFOs are doing these things that are being captured on video that are sometimes talked about in old relig religious scriptures, like the Bible. Yeah. And it's easy to, to turn away from ancient scripture and say those people didn't know what they were talking about or they misinterpreted what they witnessed. But here we are today, something challenging the physicalist paradigm. And it's not in a book, it's in the sky. And it's being video recorded by Navy fighter pilots and many people around the world. And on top of that, you have mental health issues. You're a you know, mental health counselor you're, yourself, and we know that there are numerous, I'm going to imagine we're talking thousands. I think Whitley Strieber had well over 100,000 reports from readers of his book, Communion, who wrote to him and said, you know, I've had similar experiences. So, it gets into the uh, literature of abductions, of Beings, non-human beings who can walk through walls and mysteriously appear in people's bedrooms who seem to have an interest in reproduction uh, of uh, humans and, and sperm and eggs and fetuses and embryos and the, and the like. Uh, so there's a whole mythology around that with, uh, with reports that were taken quite seriously by psychiatrists such as John Mack at Harvard University that there, so there's a mental health component or uh, at least a seemingly mental health component. I think John Mack would suggest that these reports came from people who were not mentally ill, but were healthy, but were labeled as probably being mentally ill. I think some people want, they need to know for sure that it was a U UFO case, but I think what happened doesn't matter so much as the fact that something happened to these people. Yeah. Maybe we can never know for sure what happened, but something did happen to cause them an extreme amount of mental duress. So that's the first layer of things is that something happened to them. Or more commonly, someone just saw something in the sky and that rocks their worldview a little bit. 
But there's so many secondary type of traumas that can occur to these people because if something happened to them or that something happened to them, they can't share it with their loved ones because their loved ones will shut them down or reject them. If they tell people at church, their church will ostracize them. If they tell the media, they'll be prone to receiving ridicule. They might lose their jobs, especially if they work as an airline pilot or any kind of government job where your sanity has to be maintained and unquestionable. Well, you mention any of these events that this happened to me or I saw this and your sanity is immediately questioned. That's a profound sense of rejection put upon a person. All of these things uh, being ostracized, rejected. This could be cause for divorce, for your children leaving you. So many social problems can occur to someone because something happened to them and they wanted to share it with someone. And so they find themselves unable to share honestly and openly. And so they remain wounded by the experience. There is a, a literature um, going back, I remember in the 1950s, a popular play. It was performed on television uh, called about a rabbit, Harvey. And, and so there's a man who believes he's having conversations with this rabbit, six foot tall rabbit. In fact, I believe in Ireland, there's a legend about the puka, a six foot tall rabbit that talks to people. And of course, people who talk to the puka are considered nuts. And in this play, the, this poor man is ridiculed, uh, although the, he does nothing wrong. He's not harming anybody. Then in the last scene of the play, we see the rabbit uh -huh. <laughs> uh, uh, appear. So, so this idea that there are people who live outside the normal social norms who are having, let's call it psychic experiences or paranormal experiences, we don't know the source of the experience. It, it goes back to um, a, an understanding that precedes the whole UFO era. Mm -hmm. And these people who have these experiences can either be cast out and rejected, and sometimes they become the prophet. Sometimes they they uh, they now they have something to speak about, and if it does connect with the populace, then they're a person of value, which is tricky in itself because you can easily become a cult leader, <laughs> a religious leader. You can use it for any number All of All kinds of traps. All kinds of traps when you have uh, some degree of power over people because you're sharing experiences and ideas that appeal to them. Yeah. So it's a really complicated situation with so many people having experiences and, you know, my hope is my personal hope is to find ways to support them, to tell them we we believe you, you're not crazy, you shouldn't lose your job, and it's hopefully the, the family system can stay together. Hopefully people don't get ostracized from their church or from their, their community support. Mm. These things happen, and so I think two things are necessary for the whole population to open up to the possibility that UFOs are real. And then for people to find support systems so that even if those around them don't agree with them, they have some place to find help. Yeah. Now, there's the religious perspective, and I've interviewed uh, Charles Upton, a religious traditionalist, happens to be a Muslim. Uh, he converted to Islam, was raised as a Catholic. But in any case, he would say uh, the traditionalist view is that these Entities come from the realm that Muslims refer to as the jinn or the genies, uh, that they are supernormal beings uh, that are well known in religious traditions, angels and demons or diamonds, uh, something like um, Socrates referred to his own diamond, a, a, a spiritual entity of some sort uh, that interact with the, uh, in the human world. And, and there's a vast, vast literature uh, of, of this sort that also makes sense. And uh, for the most part, you know, the mental health community is not a prepared to address that. No, not at all. Um, I think it's still very new. Even though John Mack did so much groundbreaking work in his time, there's still such a small group of people that he was able to to work with 
but that idea that professionals could be available to assist you if you've had an anomalous experience, it's still very new. I could imagine maybe I've had a very strange experience and my wife can't believe me, my family, my parents don't believe me, uh, my religious group tells me to go away, that, that I'm being rejected so harshly by people who purported to care for me, that the idea of going to a complete stranger like, what am I going to get from that? You know, these people treated me so poorly. How, how will I be treated by someone like that? They might want to put me on medication or put me in a straight jacket. I have no idea. So I think it's still maybe the early days, the idea that you could go to someone like a therapist or a counselor, a support group, and be accepted. Now, I know there are movements within the field of counseling and psychotherapy to deal with this. There's transpersonal psychology. There's a whole field of anomalistics now in, in psychology. There's a, a field known as a, a spiritual crisis that comes up in psychology. But you've just completed a master's degree in counseling mm -hmm. at uh, Regis University. Was any of that mentioned in your training? No, not at all. And, and it's not just that. There are other themes of regular life that weren't mentioned because you can only cover so much in a master's program. But something happened one day that inspired me to write this book to support people. Was It was a group counseling class, and we were going to create our own groups and lead them and using our peers as group members. And I chose the topic of UFOs. It would be a support group for people who had an extreme experience. And I let my classmates know, I'm going to show you some footage that has shown on the news about these Navy pilots and what they recorded, just letting you know ahead of time. And as soon as I announced that, one of my classmates stood up and walked out. I gave my presentation, and later on, the student returned and privately, quietly apologized and said, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't stay because this topic freaks me out. I've never seen one but it freaks me out. That was their words. And I had to honor that and respect that. And it opened up my eyes because here's someone with the means, education, to attend a master's program who presumably is very intelligent, who had to leave the room because I was going to show a video of what was purported to be a real UFOs. They, they didn't want to be in the room, which is extreme. So that's I wonder what portion of the population feels the same way, that this stuff is showing up on their TVs, on their internet, <laughs> on their Facebook feed, and they would rather not. And so there's some sort of unspoken crisis, I think, happening. And these people cannot speak out because um, they might get shut down too. By their, there's the flip side that people who do believe in UFOs or have experienced them, they say, I, I don't have a problem with them. And I don't understand why people are scared of them. I don't understand why people don't believe in them. And so they, they're also being, I, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but they're sort of shutting down the other person's experience that what's the big deal? Or maybe they've just watched a lot of UFO movies and they don't really know how they would respond if they saw one in their backyard. They could respond very differently than they th how they think they would respond. But it g allows them very little empathy for people who are actually struggling with the idea that this is a real situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure it's the case, speaking from my own personal experience, I've never, to my knowledge, seen a UFO, but I've had many dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, UFOs and aliens, and uh, some positive, some not. So then there's the issue, are they friendly or not? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a fair, it's an important question. Can we put all extraterrestrials or non-human intelligence in the same basket? Are they all good? Are they all bad? Is it a mix? Are, th are there more than one species? And many people say there are. And how do we how do we decide which ones are good or bad? Do these terms even apply mm -hmm. in this case? So I think it requires a really slow and sophisticated period of thinking, reflection, maybe thinking in new ways about 
who and what these beings are, what they mean to us, what we mean to them. It's not so cut and dry. In a survey that I put out, I asked people, do you think that maybe we should determine their intentions carefully, slowly, before taking military action against them? Because I know there have been times in the past few decades when one or two fighter pilots have fired upon a UFO, not with good results. So maybe shooting at these things should not be our first response. Maybe what maybe appears to be happening with the military, with the Navy now, to just observe and don't attack, if that's really what's happening. I, don't, I couldn't know for sure, but hopefully that's what's happening. We're remaining peaceful, non-reactive, just observing, hoping no accidents happen before taking stronger action. Well, let's talk about your survey. Mm -hmm. In... In 2022, I put out a survey that had over 60 questions about how people think they would respond in an extreme UFO situation. For example, if a UFO was spotted floating over the city for 12 hours or more, that's pretty extreme. I also asked some questions about how they responded during the COVID crisis, because that was the most recent global um, crisis where people re tend to, tended to respond in similar ways. Now, of course, COVID is nothing like a UFO encounter, but it's really about how humans act during times of stress and crisis. How do people respond? So I ask questions like, did you buy more toilet paper and food? And we know that there was a run on toilet paper. Did you buy weapons during COVID? Um, and questions like that. Then I ask them the same questions. If you saw a UFO for 12 hours, would you go buy extra food and toilet paper? Would you go buy a gun? Would you flee the city? And I, you know, wanted to com compare their responses and they, they were pretty similar. Um, very, actually very few people on both sides went out and bought weapons. Mm -hmm. Some did buy extra provisions. I was surprised to learn that very few people would elect to or very few people believe that they would leave the city if there was a UFO floating overhead for 12 hours. Now, of course, the survey really asked people w how they believe they would respond in a crisis, because that could be very different from what they actually end up doing if something like that were to happen. But it was, in a way, the survey not only asked them questions about how they believe they would, um, how they would behave, but it was a way of introducing them to the idea that this could happen. Introducing them to the idea that things that they might think only happen over there or in other parts of the world, like COVID beginning in China, then suddenly it's in Italy, but it'll never come to the US. Well, it did. So maybe we hear about strange phenomena occurring somewhere else, but it'll never happen in my neighborhood. Well, now we're softening to the idea that this could happen, and things seem to be speeding up lately. Now, that could just be the effect of the Internet and the transmission of information is increasing. Maybe nothing really is going to happen anytime soon, or nothing more. But the way it appears is that more and more is happening, more is being captured on camera, more people are talking about their experiences, more people are writing books and making extraordinary documentaries for the public to see with great footage. So more and more is out there, and there's some people who are completely open to it, loving it, because it's confirming their beliefs, and some people really wish they just wouldn't see any of it, because it's terrifying to them. And so how do we, how do we help everyone? There is a feeling that's been expressed by many people that the human species, the human population is being prepared for something. Uh, there are many different ways of uh, conceptualizing it. One way that's common, I think, in the parapsychological literature is that we are like caterpillars and we are being prepared to uh, become a whole new species like caterpillars turning into butterflies, that we're, we're going to open up to whole new realms of perception. Uh, I kind of like that uh, <laughs> metaphor. It's, it's a metaphor. Uh, other people say, well, we're being prepared to enter into the galactic federation mm. of interstellar traveling species. 
um, which may be a, a, another metaphor for the same thing. I personally haven't seen any evidence for that. Speaking scientifically, do I see evidence for us entering a galactic mission of any type? I haven't seen any. Now, I think, though, in an organic way, we are changing very quickly because of the transmission of information in, with the Internet. Being exposed to videos of UFOs, so our beliefs are being molded over time. We are opening up to new possibilities. If With ordinary physics, we're learning things about reality that would have seemed completely out of the realm of possibility 100 or 200 years ago. So I think we are changing in terms of what we know and what we believe. That's changing. The question is, what portion of the population will will roll with the punches, will we'll be okay with that change. What percentage of the population may remain in the back severely traumatized, struggling, um, having a lot of internal conflict about the issue? So we need to consider everyone with this picture. Some of us have, uh, we're blessed to have lives where we can think about UFOs. Some people are just worried about where they're going to get their next meal. They can't even afford to think about this issue. So to think globally really means thinking about everyone on all strata of society and to be compassionate to them too. So, and there's the other question too that to be prepared, let's say we were being prepared to join a larger society, a, a cosmic society, what do we have to do to prepare ourselves? Because is it just about believing that they exist or developing our technology? The human race has a horrible track record for empathy and the appropriate use of power. <laughs> One of the questions from my survey was, do you think that maybe we should um, end war before we consider taking the human species to other planets? And a lot of people, of course, said yes to that to that one, that, that that should be a requirement, partly because of the money that would need to be spent to develop technology to go mm -hmm. out to the stars. But also, we're pretty close to annihilating ourselves anyway, and we need to stop that. <laughs> we need to preserve ourselves here and now. Whether or not UFOs exist, can we become more civil? Can we develop more empathy? So many of the world's problems would be reduced if we just learn to share. I mean, sometimes some of these come down to the issue of greed, mm -hmm. the root of many problems. And greed as individuals, as, as politicians, as social and religious leaders, this greed and competitiveness, maybe that's what we need to work on. Could we eliminate poverty? Can we improve mental health care? Can we care for each other? And maybe that's, that's something we have to accomplish before we're even able to be accepted by some more sophisticated race. Well, that's a big agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end war and poverty. <laughs> However, uh, I recently, just a few days ago, was in Alamogordo, New Mexico, where they have the Museum of Space Exploration. And in that museum, a large portion of it, I think an entire floor practically, was devoted to the Star Trek television program, which has been on the air now, uh, what, since the 1960s. Regular program. I, I, I think the original Star Trek ran only one season, but it led to all of uh, these offshoots and uh, repetitions and, and so on. It's had a huge cultural impact. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And here's a little fact. I don't know if you realize Gene Roddenberry, the uh, inventor the mind behind the whole Star Trek series was a colleague of a person you and I were recently discussing, Andrea Puharic, the psychical researcher who, amongst other things, was a psychedelic pioneer, a parapsychology pioneer, a neurosurgeon. But he also engaged in uh, working with channelers to communicate with mysterious entities referred to as the Nine, who could be identified with and were, by Puharic, identified with UFO phenomena. Mm -hmm. And so, in, in that way, we can ask, are, are we being prepared yeah. through these communications that are happening to scientists, 
to politicians, even to some pop stars, people who have an influence over the rest of society, which would be a clever way to affect change on a grand scale. To get to people who have the possibility or the, the ability to to change people's minds, to open people's minds up. And Star Trek is a wonderful example because that series exhibits the very best that humanity has to offer. That we can live in a community with people who look different from us, who whose lifestyles are different from our individual lifestyles. That, I mean, in a society where currency doesn't really apply anymore, everyone has found their role to contribute, to give and receive in a fair exchange, that everyone finds their place in education and medicine, all of that is at a much higher level than it is today, motivated or brought about by different motivations. So Star Trek is a, is sort of like a, the beacon that we could aspire to be that way. And I think we, we can. And then I'd, I'd be more optimistic about it. let's take let's become that and then go out to the stars. Because if our planet were to board a mothership right now and go out there, we'll be taking our aggression and greed and selfishness and we'll take our warfare with us anywhere we go and our pollution. <laughs> you know, we'll we'll bring it all with us. So I think it's really important to, no matter what happens, to still ask the question, does the human being exist? And how is the human being to exist? Well, to enlarge the conversation a little bit, there's a person who lives here in Albuquerque who I've never met face to face, but I uh, hope someday I'll have the pleasure of meeting Linda Moulton Howe, who's done research on cattle mutilations. But I was informed that she recently gave a presentation at a, a UFO meeting, I think something called uh, Contact in the Desert or something like that. And she stood up. This is a woman with a, a career in journalism and, and is considered a credible spokesman for events of high strangeness, who, who said the U.S. already possesses three starships capable of leaving the solar system. She named them. They have, you know, names after famous admirals or something of that sort. So, I don't know that this is true. I'm inclined to at the moment until I have further evidence to say it's folklore that, you know, she picked up somewhere along the way. But apparently she believes that it's true. Uh, but, and, and so there's this myth of the secret space program that we're already out there, but, but it's being kept hidden from us. Mm. Right. I, and I, I've heard similar messages from different people. Most recently, there are the David Grush interviews yes. and his testimony, mm -hmm. which is really important. I always personally come up against a wall because I understand that so much of this is hearsay. Yeah. And we, a person can say, my sources are trustworthy. I trust them. I trust them. But I personally like more evidence than that. It is not enough for me. And I think it's important for people to really take a step back when they're hearing these very provocative messages. They're very juicy and wonderful folklore, powerful mythology, but take a step back and say, is what they're saying, is that enough for me to believe it 100%? Or can I take it in and say, I will consider that, but I'm going to withhold forming a conclusion before I actually see something with my own eyes or get more substantial information. So not, not to criticize uh, Miss Moulton Howe or anyone else in that field, I'm just saying um, I'm open to receive more information, just hearsay or or that that there are people sharing or holding secrets or there's a secret program, maybe, maybe not. And for me, it's not enough for me to to change how I think about life or do basic decision making. You know, I, I'll hold it, 
but I'm not going to swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Well, I agree with you. We, what we need is evidence. At the same time, these reports, it's not, they're not just one or two isolated reports. I think Linda Moulton Howe's presentation was on the extreme end, but the, the truth is for the last half century, there have been numerous people who, and a vast literature of people who claim to have had face-to-face -face conversations with aliens who have been aboard their ships. Some people claim they piloted the ships or were taken to other places in the galaxy and returned to Earth. Uh, so, the, the number of these reports is, is really, if you began to add them all up, it's quite substantial. Right. Indicating this might be a natural part of the human experience. Maybe it doesn't happen to everyone, but it happens often enough that something is happening. I had an encounter myself in what, I, what people call the liminal space, perhaps in an out-of-body environment. I had a very intimate interaction with what appeared to be a female or feminine type of being. And the problem I have, I, I wrote about it in one of my books. I regret it now because it's so... It's such a fragile experience. I have no physical evidence for it. And it's very, it is very intimate the way I described it. And it's almost embarrassing. And, and so I don't talk about it very much. And so I'm divided. Sometimes I even doubt myself about it, which makes it hard sometimes to doubt, or to believe other people's accounts. But it's not because of them, it's because I have my own personal issues around, around the matter. Mm -hmm. But it's complicated, but you're so right. It's happened so much. And thankfully, because people can write books and be interviewed and post things online, that it is undeniable. Something is happening. Something. But is it a secret government program? Is the government working in tandem with non-humans? Um, are non-humans doing their own thing and they're appearing like human beings on this planet? Uh, I can't say for sure. I'm open to all of it. I'm just very careful to stand up and say, yes, this is the absolute truth. Well, Whitley Strieber, uh, whom I've interviewed many times, uh, has written in graphic detail about having had sec a sexual encounter with an alien being uh, who he you know, described immediately thereafter to his wife, uh, who, who said, that's nice, dear, <laughs> it was accepting. Of, of the experience. And then Whitley co-authored a book with Jeffrey Kripal, professor of religion and philosophy at Rice University, who said, oh my, I had a similar experience. It happened in uh, Calcutta during the festival uh, for the goddess, I think, Durga. And uh, the, the being who appeared to me was, was a Hindu goddess. And, but it was exactly of the ex kind of experience Whitley reported. And uh, again, the, the literature uh, is, if you read the writings of David Jacobs, a former professor of history at um, Pennsylvania, um, the university is on the tip of my tongue. In any case, uh, he says, you know, people who report these kinds of sexual encounters with non-human beings uh, is numerous. I, and I, when you say you had an intimate experience, I, I'm imagining maybe it was along those lines. It was very much. And part of the experience included what some people might label a kundalini experience, mm -hmm. this, this rush of energy through the spine, uh, which left me with nothing but a big fat question mark. What happened and what was the purpose of it? Mm. It's before we move on about the book uh, with Jeffrey Kripal and Whitley Strieber, so, I love that book. Such a perfect match of two these two co-authors from different perspectives. I just encourage anyone to read that book. It, it's it's amazing. The supernatural. Yes, mm -hmm. and Whitley's experience with how society has accepted him after that, or made fun of him yeah. because of what happened, is a perfect example of the trauma that can occur to someone simply because they were brave enough to share their experience publicly. Yeah. That the, the public, a large part of it, responds in a very ugly manner, which is so unfortunate. Um, I even feel bad for saying, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to 
swallow everything hook, line, and sinker because that can feel like a form of rejection to some of these people's accounts. And I don't want it to come across that way, that I'm willing to receive it, but I'm always looking for more verification. But the religious aspect, too, is important because I believe when people are interested in seeing UFOs or when they do see them, it's akin to a religious experience. And I think I see the draw, in which I share, to want to see them in the sky because I think on some level we realize there's we are in union with them, that they are part of the same reality that we are, but they give us access to a deeper part of reality, just the same way other religious experiences do. So in a sense, to have an experience in person with one or in the dream state or seeing something in the sky at night takes us deeper into what it is to be alive in this universe. So that's a really profound draw, very much of a spiritual nature, I believe. And I think the what makes it complicated is, let's say someone has a traditional religious experience and they go to the town square and tell everyone what they saw and they're proclaiming this experience they had. Even today they might be sent somewhere <laughs> and put in a straitjacket or you know, given medication because when people see things that are out of the ordinary, it can be very frightening. It rocks the boat. It puts people in a state of a worldview crisis. So it's really complicated um, to, to get the information firsthand from a lived experience or to hear people saying, it's real because these 10 people in government told me that it's real. You know, there, there's so many different shades and levels of how do we receive this information? How do we respond? How much do we believe or not believe? I think the most important thing is to stay open-minded and to be, we must be supportive. As you said, there have been so many accounts in modern society, ancient society, and the, this idea about sex with a non-human entity. If you look at some of the ancient scriptures in Asia, and let's say in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's rare accounts of, of yogis who have a sexual encounter with what they refer to as a deity, uh, the yidam. Um, so these these tutelary deities that don't appear quite human. They actually sort of a little bit look like the classical gray. They might have more than one, two or four arms but, and they're carrying implements, but that they had, they practiced a form of Tantra using sexual union to move the energies and to open one's mind. And then they learned how to do that practice with a, with a human partner. But sometimes the stories begin with they had the experience with this being that arrived and it was not a human being. And could it be that it was one of these extraterrestrials or non-human intelligences coming? And maybe that's their way of introducing new information to the human race. Mm -hmm. And maybe they have all the time in the universe to sit and wait for it to take effect, to wake us up. They may be operating on a completely different time scale. And in fact, uh, one of my faculty advisors uh, when I got my doctoral degree at Berkeley was James Harder, professor who became the research director for the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, which back in the 70s was one of the big UFO research organizations. And he specialized in hypnotizing people who had reported UFO contact and communication with the aliens. And he explained to me that in his research, it seemed as if the average alien lifespan was about 20,000 of our years. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> they would have a very different uh, perspective if that's being the case. Right. But let me bring up another point. There is a group of people, Ray Hernandez, uh, who has been interviewed many times on this channel, being the foremost, and his philosophy is that there's one phenomenon going on. It's about consciousness. He sometimes calls it the mind of God. Mm -hmm. And whether you access it through psychedelics, through alien encounters, through remote viewing, through out-of-body experience, through UFO abductions, through apports, etc., it's all one phenomenon from one source. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a compelling view. I, I think it's important to look at the holistic picture. But on the other hand, 
It might well be the case that these are all distinct, that aliens, uh, let's say extraterrestrials coming from another star system, may be completely distinct from Hindu goddesses who come and have sex with people. Uh, that, that we need to see these phenomena as, as unique and not lump them all together. I think there's the temptation to put it in a way that's more understandable for the human mind. Yeah. We have to acknowledge that the, the brain has its limits. There are creatures on planet Earth that can do things that humans can't. The way whales communicate or dolphins communicate. Their brains, the way elephants think, the human brain just can't. So we, we must acknowledge that we believe we're the most intelligent creature on planet Earth. And for those who don't believe in life on other planets, we're the most intelligent thing in the universe. But it could just be that we've... D We've grown up in a three-dimensional reality or four dimensions with time, with linear time moving in one direction. That's what our brain is used to. Yeah. But what if there are brains existing in other beings that are used to living in five and six dimensions that operate completely differently, they move differently, they think and feel differently, um, and they're in one dimension. And uh, there's some other dimension of reality where they're entirely different and maybe they're not even physical at all. Mm -hmm. So we start to see this division um, of other physical beings, the non-physical beings. Uh, I'm just going to use the word angel. That's just one word. Yeah. You know, there are probably 10,000 other words for these non-physical mm -hmm. beings that have different types of access to the deeper reality. And so we're just on one of those levels and we can only see so far and we're trying so hard to understand it I really believe it's far more sophisticated than the human brain can understand and perhaps it's after we die and our consciousness is no longer tethered to the perception of the brain that we can actually understand what's really going on let's try to get down to brass tacks for a moment. What if I'm a person viewing this conversation right now and I feel like I'm being hounded or persecuted by these entities as, for example, Chris Bledsoe, an interviewee on this channel, had felt for years that they were ruining his life. Mm -hmm. what, what, and I'm sure there are people out there who feel that right now. What do you recommend? The first thing I recommend it is just ordinary physical stuff. Find a support system. Find someone who will tell you, I believe you. Because if anything, not being able to find that is like pouring salt in the wound. They're being, they feel like they're being hurt or they are being hurt, harassed, weird, uh, weird things are happening at home or in their bodies. They just need someone to say, I believe you. I'm willing to listen to you. Find someone who is always there or willing to get more reports to to exchange ideas to show care empathy for this person it's so healing on some level now of course someone's going to say well that's not enough to stop the harass how do we stop the harassment there's dealing with the trauma and supporting the the victim for lack of a better word how do we stop that and off the cuff, I, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a school of psychotherapy, very obscure, called uh, spirit releasement mm -hmm. th therapy, or uh, in, in the Catholic Church, it might be called exorcism. I mean, there there are in, in, certainly in in the professional literature and in the folklore, there are methods for getting rid of uh, uh, pesky spirits. Or, or uh, obsessing spirits, but maybe it's not that at all. Maybe it's the issue was a, a sociological issue. I think it, there's a chapter in your book about when do I call a lawyer? <laughs> Absolutely, and that and that really has to do with the uh, the whole ufology scene. I, I see ufology is becoming a big industry. Uh, you mentioned the the Contact in the Desert conference. Any kind of conference is a huge profit machine for the people holding the conference because people are buying tickets, they're buying vendor booths. So it's an industry in and of itself. It's its own entertainment industry. And how would it be to someone, someone is a witness and then someone shows up with a camera crew 
and they produce a movie and make money, and but they abandon the witness. And this this happens, or it used to happen more often, with anthropological studies, where scientists would go to a remote country to visit a remote culture, study them, write their books, their doctoral thesis, <laughs> give teachings about it. They've affected the community, but they didn't give anything back. And so what's happening with witnesses or victims or people have had encounters with, with UFOs and aliens? The people come and take from them for entertainment, for money, for research. You know, so I think it, as people get more savvy, they'll understand that when you have an encounter or if you receive an object from a UFO or if you have physical ev evidence of some type, it is an asset that at some point may be commercially used or used for commercial co commercial purposes, for monetary gain. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate that? Because right now I think I see a lot of people being taken advantage of. And so that's why I bring up the issue of get a lawyer. If something significant happens, also the lawyer might help you if <laughs> your job is at risk <laughs> or if anything else happens, if there's a negative response that happens to you, maybe talk to a lawyer first. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk to a therapist first. Uh, maybe don't tell your immediate family if you know that they will respond negatively. Find other people to share with, maybe a support group, that you can practice telling your story to in a way that won't be triggering to other people. So practice telling your story instead of just putting it out to the person closest to you and then breaking that relationship or risking that relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So being careful about something happened to me, how do I tell others? Which is unfortunate because the same thing happens to people who have been assaulted in ordinary ways or been violated in certain ways. We want to say they should be able to just speak their truth to anyone and receive full support. But more often than not, that is not the case. I remember a time in my life, I was much younger, half a century ago, I was assaulted. Uh, by people with a knife, people who threatened to kill me. And uh, it was traumatic. And, and I needed to talk and talk and talk and talk about it. And the truth is that my friends got tired of hearing me talk about it. They heard it once, mm -hmm. but it took me months to process. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, you reach a point where even the people who are sympathetic are tired of hearing your story. Right. But you might not be done telling it. Yeah. So finding skillful ways to process one's experience is important. And right now I think it, we're just at the beginning of knowing that that's something that is important as part of this process. A process that may be occurring more often to a wider group of people yeah. as we move into the future. How do we take care of each other emotionally and psychologically with more and more UFO encounters happening? How do we protect each other? How do we support each other? Yeah. Well, we don't have all the answers, Sean, but it's important to raise the issue. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done a very good job doing that with your book and, and with this conversation. So once again, I want to thank you very much for being with me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.